um, record. Okay, so it is considered to be one of the non-specific internal defenses, okay, because it's, when I say system-wide, it's a body-wide type of scenario, all right, in which when the body does engage and uh, elicit a fever, all right, a lot of it, and I did briefly kind of talk about this, and this was with the other section, um, I had two students, anyone here in this section take microbiology? No, okay, all right, so you know, I mean, certain, certain bacteria and viruses, but more so bacteria, they're very, very finicky, specific. They have to have a certain temperature, right? And if they're not within a certain temperature, it affects their ability to metabolize, to uh, reproduce. So that's why, all right, the nice thing about our, when your body turns the heat up, you can decrease the reproduction of these uh, viruses and the bacteria just by turning your body temperature up a couple of degrees, all right? Now, there's some pretty hardy bacteria out there, okay? Uh, there's theorized that there's some bacteria that live at the center of the earth. I don't know. I've never been there. I don't know anyone else that has been, so how would you know? But that's, but they found that there's some bacteria that can actually survive the internal temperatures of volcanoes, which is several thousands of degrees, all right? So they're pretty rough and tumble. Um, I just hope they don't live in me. All right, so um, fever will help to decrease the ability of certain viruses and bacteria to reproduce. Remember these guys, interferons. Interferons are those chemicals that these cells will produce, all right, your liver uh, mainly that helps to initiate and stimulate certain cells to engage in uh, innate immunity, okay? Our natural killer cells, for example, uh, benefit from interferon activity. So we can actually increase the interferon activity. All right, um, adaptive immunity we're going to talk about today. Just know that it's going to increase some of the activities of the adaptive immunity because, all right, we'll see it increasing some of the interferon activity, all right, but also other chemical messengers which will be involved, all right? Tissue repair, we talked about the phases of tissue repair, inflammation and whatnot, and everything that goes along with that. So um, when you have a fever, that tissue repair uh, will increase because we're going to increase a lot of the metabolism for the cells and the tissues that are involved in that in, in certain regions there. Does anyone remember what a CAM is? CAM is a cell adhesion molecule. Now remember, when your uh, leukocytes are flowing through the bloodstream in a normal scenario, they're just going to move along, all right, just like if you threw trash in a river and the river was a strong current, it would just flush it down, you know, the river. Well, CAMs allow these cells, these leukocytes, to stick right, onto the cell walls of the blood vessels. Right? That analogy that I use of me sticking my hand out as you're floating down the river and you're grabbing onto my hand, that's what a CAM does. It grabs onto a cell and slows it down so it can undergo what we call diapodesis. It's called margination when they move towards the, the, the uh, periphery. Right? Normally, the cells will flow right down the middle. Okay, but when we get these cam formations, these little arms that stick out, the cells will attach onto those, okay, or they'll slow them down. And that gives the cell close enough to the edge of the blood vessel, okay, where it can eventually squeeze through, all right? And that process of it squeezing through between the cells is called diapodesis, right? And then that's when we want to get those leukocytes out of the bloodstream and into the tissues if there's an infectious agent in the tissues or if there's damage to the tissues. Most likely, you know, if there's damage to the tissue, we're gonna see some effect infectious agents there, okay? And this helps to promote more immune cells to head to the area because they'll release chemicals that attract those chemotoxic agents which will attract other immune cells, more leukocytes, okay? So that's why Again, it depends on your philosophy. Um, for me, I do agree with leaving a low-grade fever untreated. You know, there's a reason for your body turning up the heat a little bit, so to speak. So now, you know, younger uh, little kids have a tendency to run a little bit warmer, but usually around 102, 103, I kind of get nervous, especially uh, at 103. Most likely then I'm going to do something about the fever, all right? For adults, you know, we... All right, uh, when we start to get to 106, that's bad. You know, that's that, you're going to start damaging uh, nervous tissue in your brain. That's not a good thing. All right, 109, 
you know, you're pretty much sizzling your insides. Right? Has anyone ever gone to, um, what's the name of that, the melting pot? Fondue, if you like fondue. Um, fondue if you don't. If you go to the melting pot, all right, you're essentially cooking, <laughs> all right, your food in this hot, uh, uh, well, we were cooking the, the entree in the water there. Um, but that's essentially what's going on. You're going to start boiling things inside your body, and that's bad. It can eventually cause death here. All right. So when we see fevers of about 103 or higher in kids, then we start to get a little bit uh, uh, concerned all right, about how dangerous that can occur. All right. The big issue is when you get really high fevers, you undergo this process here. Okay. Denaturation of proteins. What does that mean? All right. Denaturation of proteins means you start – to unravel and break proteins down. Okay? See chapter four, all right, for all the functions of proteins, catalysts, enzymes, transportation, all right, they help with so many functions in the body. So if we start to break them down or cause them to unravel, all right, we destroy their, their functions. All right, we are disabling our, our metabolic mechanisms of our, of our bodies significantly. All right, so that's a problem. We don't want that, that to occur. All right, we start to creep up to 106, 107. All right, now we're really playing with fire here because now we increase the risk of seizures. All right, simply because we're dealing with nervous tissue. All right, and seizures, I can't talk to I'm thinking of a Caesar salad. Uh, seizures, all right, seizures are aberrant action potential electrical activity in the brain. So we're essentially short-circuiting our brain, all right? And there's causes for that in this case. Because of that excessively high fever, you are increasing the risk, all right, of having some brain issues, all right? So after an infection occurs, Okay, and we'll see this in a couple different uh, uh, scenarios here. All right, we have fallen soldiers, dead soldiers, all the participants of that infection. And if you remember last week, we were talking about this whole scenario here with inflammation, the kid falling on the skateboard, all right, and we walked through all the steps here, okay? Well, we never talked about the aftermath, all right? What happens afterwards, the prologue, so to speak, okay? And that's where this term comes from, pus or exudate, okay? That's going to be pretty much everything that was involved in that inflammatory response, but all the dead leftover junk, okay? So if there's infectious agents, dead dying infectious agents, white blood cells that are dead, all right? And even some of the leftover damaged tissue, okay? So a lot of this material, as this process is ongoing, gets removed. When I worked at Applebee's, and yes, I worked at Applebee's, we had a philosophy, clean as you go. Right? And your body does that. It kind of cleans you know, up the area of injury and gets rid of certain things. But sometimes, it, depending on how much damage or what occurs, it doesn't get everything. All right? Most of the, the leftover stuff or the junk gets cleared by the, the lymphatic system all right? or through diffusion within the skin. Some doesn't, okay? and it can be left there. All right? And so what your body does is it starts to kind of section off the area. All right, we're all, it's like a graveyard. You put a fence around the graveyard. Well, in this case, our fence that we're going to put up around all the, the, the dead, dying debris and leftover stuff, we're going to use collagen. Okay? And so collagen does a great job because it kind of seals it off and packages away. There's a condition uh, that occurs in your lungs called um, sarco sarcoidosis. Okay? And you have... These areas of infection all throughout your lung, also it happens with tuberculosis too, in which you have the, the, the fibroblasts and the macrophages will seal off these infectious agents into these abscesses. And so it's pretty much put all the harmful things all right, in this little cyst-like structure or this abscess and it's protected from the, the good tissue. It'll stay there. All right, now sometimes these, these, these uh, sarcoids may rupture and then that becomes a medical issue, all right? And in tuberculosis, sometimes these abscesses become active again, and so uh, the, uh, the tuberculosis uh, uh, infectious organism starts to reproduce and repopulate, and then the body calls more macrophages there. Anyways, so we have these abscesses, which we've just sectioned off, 
all right, this, these, this dead material, okay, and in some cases, all right, you might have to undergo surgery. Has anyone ever gone to the YouTube channel, Dr. Pimple Popper? Yeah, I've never gone because that stuff disgusts me. It's really, there's some people that love to see that stuff, and I've seen some clips which is nasty, nasty, nasty. But it's so funny if you type in, all right, in Google or YouTube or whatever, just DR doctor. That's the first thing that pops up is Dr. Pimple Popper. Um, anyways, and so Dr. Pimple Popper is going to be going to town on these things. All right, it's just nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. Okay. So we talked about acute inflammation. Usually lasts eight to 10 days. It goes past eight to 10 days, then it becomes a problem, and we get what's called chronic inflammation. All right, chronic inflammation is going to be longer, about two weeks long, all right, when which we're going to see a prolonged reaction, all right, in a situation that if it lasts for an extended period of time, all right, past the acute phase, and in some situations, it depends on how bad, you know, how overwhelmed the body is with infectious agents, okay? Um, weeks, months, years, bad, okay? You're going to have permanent tissue damage in that situation, but let's not go there. Initially, when you have acute inflammation, and you should know this, the first two cell types that are at the site of inflammation are going to be my buddies, the macrophages, and neutrophils. They're the ones that are first on scene. And it makes sense because neutrophils are the most abundant, all right, um, leukocytes in, in the body. Okay? So they're going to be first on scene. All right? So if you're doing a histological slide of some tissue, all right, and if I see macrophages and neutrophils, then I know it's relatively acute. But if I'm seeing macrophages and lymphocytes, because these guys come in later, then I know that we're dealing with a chronic inflammatory issue going on. Right? And we don't want that. Okay? So we'll commonly see chronic inflammation. It could be some sort of, uh, of overuse injury, perfect example like tendonitis, all right? tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, uh, Achilles tendon strains. Um, we'll also see it in folks that have some, I don't want to, when I say malnutrition, I don't want you to think that they're undernourished, is that they are eating a diet that promotes inflammation, processed garbage, which is what most of us eat. I raise my hand because I'm one of those people. I'm guilty of it, although I did have a salad. Uh, Chick-fil-A makes the best salad, by the way. Um, the Southwest salad is really good. Anyways, all right, so uh, what you'll see is when you have these chronic inflammation types of injuries or conditions, all right, a medical history of that person needs to be assessed. All right, so if it continues, we should consider one thing, that the body has yet to eliminate whatever the causative agent is. So we need to make sure that whatever was the pathogen of the acute response, all right, has been eliminated, okay? If not, then that's why we're getting that chronic inflammation. If it is, then most likely it's going to be some sort of mechanical issue, like an overuse injury, all right, arthritis degeneration, something of that nature here. Right. Also, we cannot rule out autoimmune disorder. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what involves uh, the autoimmune kind of reaction, which is really interesting because, especially, well, there's only Tracy and I are the only two people in here, um, but uh, women are more prone to autoimmune uh, uh, disorders. So, you all need to pay attention. Um, and it, part of it is because I think that it's your immune systems are much better than males. Right. So when this occurs, when this chronic inflammation occurs, this is what we have to be concerned about, is tissue destruction, all right? Especially if it's, uh, uh, for example, in your joints, let's say, your knees, elbows, spine, all right? When you start to degenerate tissue, cartilage, for example, all right, especially the articular cartilage in the knees or whatnot, if that starts to degenerate, it's gone. Right? And then you start to get arthritis, and that becomes a problem, and then it results in some scar tissue formation, which then just propagates the whole cycle there. Okay, so we're done with the first part of the immune system, the innate immune system, the first and kind of, quote, unquote, the second line of defense. First line of defense is your skin and your mucosal membranes. All right, and then the second line of defense is what I've been talking about, all right, for the past hour uh, in the previous class, when we talked about natural killer cells, macrophages just wandering around, 
all right? Inflammation, complement, all right? All those systems there that are called into play, all right, when you have just pathogens kind of wandering through your internal structures there, okay? Now we're going to get into the second type of immune system, all right, the adaptive immunity. And this is the one that takes a while to occur, all right? But you need to make sure that you star this right here. Adaptive immunity involves a specific lymphocyte, which are B cells and T cells, or excuse me, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. So it's going to be a specific B lymphocyte or T lymphocyte that responds to a specific type of antigen. So what's an antigen? Up until this point, I've been telling you an antigen is pretty much a foreign protein, but it could also be a shoe. That's not on this slide. Um, uh, 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 an antigen can also be a polysaccharide, sugar, okay, carbohydrate group, okay? So keep in mind, when these cells come in contact with a specific antigen, all right, it's going to cause this specific lymphocyte to proliferate. What does that mean? They're going to multiply. And they're going, because they're going to recruit more soldiers for the cause. We've got this antigen. All right, potentially a foreign anti, uh, antigen, a non-self bad pathogen, all right, and we need to get white blood cells involved, specifically the lymphocytes, to take care of this, all right, this issue, all right, before it becomes a problem, okay? So this takes a long time to enact, because one, all right, we have to build up the cell numbers through proliferation, but there's a little bit of time in recognition of the antigen. I'll go through all that. Okay, so this, this is where you see it takes several days. That's why we have a vaccination for certain things. So we can shorten that response time. Okay, so there's two types. All right, cell mediated, which involves our T lymphocytes or our T cells. And then we have humoral immunity. This is the one that gets all the talk right now because of the B lymphocytes and the plasma cells. Because it's the plasma cells that make the antibodies. Okay. So that's what they've been talking about. Every time you go in to get, if you want to see you have the antibody test for the COVID, all right, that's what they're assessing, the humoral immunity. doesn't mean that the cell-mediated immunity is not playing a role. And don't forget about innate immunity. All right, that's still going to also play a role in this, okay? But we're just focusing a lot in the news about the humoral immunity, okay, when we talk about COVID. Okay, so we're going to talk about the two different branches. So here's a nice, all right, uh, slide here to break it down for you. Adaptive immunity, we have our cell-mediated immunity, which includes our cytotoxic T lymphocytes and our helper T cells or T lymphocytes. Now, the helper T cells will also play a limited role with the humoral immunity, okay? But basically, what we're going to see is, all right, you have an infected cell with the cell-mediated immunity. One of our T cells is going to uh, have an interaction with this infected cell, and hopefully it's going to kill it through apoptosis, but it takes some time. And we're going to go through all the steps there, okay? When we're dealing with the humoral immunity, all right, that involves the B lymphocytes, okay? Our B lymphocytes, not all of them, but a good number will transform, all right, or turn into a plasma cell. And it's the plasma cell that makes the antibodies, okay? You need to know that. The plasma cell makes the antibodies. Okay, it's the B lymphocyte that turns into the plasma cell. Questions on that? All right, so let's talk about antigens. All right, so to give you a good understanding, all right, of what the heck an antigen is. Remember, we need to have an antigen to elicit, all right, this adaptive immunity. Okay, so our antigens, all right, will be detected by the T, by the lymphocytes, all right, and they'll initiate some sort of response. So that antigen is either a protein or a very big polysaccharide. And what will happen is this antigen, all right, will bind to a T lymphocyte or an antibody. All right, so let's talk about some of the examples of antigens. Bacteria, all right, 
the envelope that surrounds a virus or what's known as the capsid. All right, we also have the toxins that some of our bacteria produce, all right, Botox, which is crazy to me, botulinum toxin, which is one of the most paralytic, most dangerous toxins that a bacteria can produce, and we shoot it into our face. All right, now don't get me wrong, Botox has some really great medical benefits, especially if you're undergoing uh, muscle uh, spasms of, of a sort. I had a patient that had a really bad cervical torticollis, gave her some Botox injections, cleared it up, all right? She went from literally being able to lay her head on her shoulder. She could sing herself to sleep because her head was already there on her shoulder. And through physical therapy, manipulation, and then finally with the Botox injections, she looked as regular as all of us here, pretty much up and down. So it was crazy. But anyways, so bacterial toxins, all right? And then what we refer to as our tumor antigens, which are just a form of abnormal protein that will be expressed on some of these cancerous cells, all right, in our bodies, okay? So these are all examples of antigens, okay? So two very important terms are up on this slide, foreign antigens and self-antigens, okay? Foreign antigens are just antigens that are different from our own body's molecules. They don't come from us. Okay, so they're foreign, right? So it's these antigens that are, that are going to initiate our immune response. Then we have self-antigens, all right? These, are the, these antigens are us, are, they're our self. They're, they come from our own body, okay? So they do not bind to any immune component and they do not initiate, they shouldn't, I should say, initiate an immune response, okay? Because if your own body is initiating an immune response, that's an autoimmune disease, and that's bad. You can't have that. Okay, so self-antigens are, for lack of a better term, relatively harmless. They should not initiate an immune response. All right, your uh, lymphocytes should not bind to self-antigens, all right, when everything's normal, okay? It's the foreign antigens that they should be binding to, okay? They should bind to them. All right, and then we'll talk about what happens, okay, when that occurs. But when the body can't tell the difference between self antigens and foreign antigens, that's a problem, and that's usually going to fall under our autoimmune disorders here, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's look at a typical antigen here, All right, what we, what we describe as an epitope, all right? So basically, you can see here's our antigen. All right, it has all these little prongs on the end of it, all right? And we refer to those prongs, all right, as antigenic determinants. And that's where your T cells or your antibodies are going to bind onto. They're called antigenic determinants, these little prongs here that are coming up, okay? And what will happen is, all right, you'll have either the T cell, or in this picture here, we're seeing antibodies, all right, that are binding onto them, okay? But it's basically a site, all right, where one of your immune cells or an antibody can bind onto, kind of hold it for a second, we're going to bind onto you, and we're going to check you out. we got to make sure, all right, that you're supposed to be here, okay? Are you self or are you foreign? Okay, so it's going to use these determinants here, all right, for that purpose. <clears throat> all right. So now what I want to describe, because we're going to go through, I'm going to start off with, on, on a broad picture, okay, and then we're going to get more specific, all right. So, for example, remember, our adaptive immunity involves the lymphocytes, okay, B cells and T cells. So, the B lymphocytes, all right, will make a direct contact with the antigen, whereas T lymphocytes need a little bit of help, okay? So, another cell is going to help the T lymphocytes, all right, recognize the antigen, all right, and we call those cells 
A APCs, antigen presenting cells. Okay? So what happens is one of these other cells, like a macrophage or a dendrite, or excuse me, a dendritic cell, will come in contact with the antigen. Remember, this is those are the cells that I told you they're 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 phagocytic. So they'll see something, a foreign antigen or a foreign protein or whatever, and they just eat it. And then they bust it up and then they stick it all over the plasma membrane. Okay, that's what these guys are going to do. Okay. So when we're dealing with the T lymphocell, uh, lymphocytes, all right, we have another cell that is going to find the antigen, process it, and then it's going to bring it over to the T lymphocyte and show it to the T lymphocyte. And that allows the T lymphocyte to bind to the antigen presenting cell, and it's going to facilitate some sort of interaction. Nothing could happen. It might be something that's just harmless. All right, and then nothing happens. Or it could be a pathogen, and then we could initiate the immune response. Okay, so easy to remember: B lymphocyte direct interaction with the antigen. Okay, T lymphocytes. All right, there's we need another cell that's going to be involved. It's going to present the antigen to the T lymphocyte. So when we talk about the T lymphocytes, we have two types. Okay. We have our CD4 cells and our CD8 cells, otherwise known as the helper T cells for the CD4. CD stands for cluster differentiation. Okay, don't worry, there's like, there's tons of different, it's just a receptor marker, that's all, okay? So we just call it CD, okay? Cluster differentiation, all right? So the helper T cell is going to be involved in what we're gonna talk about Today and, and on third, uh, Wednesday, cell-mediated humoral immunity, which is acquired. And then we've already talked about it with innate immunity, okay, and what its role is with that. And we'll review that later on, okay? So basically, the, C, the, the helper T cells are going to facilitate the immune response by activating other cells, the NK cells, natural killer cells, right? Those are the ones that go right to town and just start destroying. Natural killer cells can do a couple things, all right? They can themselves attack a pathogen and destroy it, or they can release, all right, some cell chemicals and stimulate a macrophage to go and kill the cell, all right? And the CD's helper cells can, or CD helper cells, the helper T cells can do the same thing. They can stimulate the natural killer cells or the macrophages to go after that pathogen. Now the cytotoxic T cells, also known as, and you need to know these, the CD markers, all right, which is a CD8 cell, these cells do their job all by themselves. They don't have to recruit other cells, okay? They're gonna release these chemicals similar to what we saw the natural killer cell do. All right, the perforins and the granzymes, you know, punch holes in, into the uh, pathogen or the infected cell and then pour in the digestive enzymes and cause the cell to die through apoptosis, okay? So the helper T cells are gonna get another cell to do their bidding, all right? Whereas the cytotoxic T cells, all right, will do it directly. They do all their own he um, heavy lifting, all right? Two other types of cells that we'll talk about later on is the memory T cells and the regulatory T cells, also known as Tregs. That has to do with regulating the immune response. All right, but these are the ones I really want you to be able to differentiate between. Okay, so there's two subtypes that I really want you to focus on for the T lymphocytes. The helper cells, which are CD4, okay, and then the cytotoxic T cells, all right, which are the CD8. These numbers are going to play a role here in a second. Okay, so this is kind of showing us an example, all right? Let me point out a few things here for you. Okay, so here you can see all right, our helper T cells and our cytotoxic T cells, okay? So this TCR stands for T cell receptor, okay? So all these cells, and you can see here, each of these cells has about 100,000 receptors all over the place, okay? 
So you'll have your T cell receptors, and then you've got this other, which I was just telling you about, which is another type of receptor. All right, this is called the CD4. It's a transmembrane protein. Okay, it helps to stabilize interactions between the T cells and whatever they're hooking up with, which, which will make more sense later on when we talk about it. Okay, so just be familiar with both of these. All right, so the helper T cells, CD4 protein, all right, and then our cytotoxic T cell, all right, has the CD8 protein. And then you can see here our lymphocyte, all right, and it's B cell, that's what BCR stands for, B cell receptor. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about, all right, remember this all has to do with an antigen. There's an antigen floating around. And now we have to actually, all right, find this antigen, all right, and then present it to one of our uh, lymphocytes. Okay. So here's what we're going to see. Okay. We talk about antigen presentation. All right, we have cells that can display the antigen, the antigen presenting cells, all right, directly onto their plasma membrane. Okay, so here's what we're going to deal with when we talk. Remember, antigens can be either be two types self or foreign, right? Okay, self or foreign. So these antigens are going to be displayed on the plasma membranes. Okay. Now, there's two categories, all right, for all right, these antigens. The first one is every single nucleated cell in your body, all right, is going to present antigens, all right? And so we also have the other category, a special cell called the antigen presenting cells. All right, so constantly all the cells in your body are constantly placing antigens all right, onto their plasma membranes, okay? And this is a way when you undergo what's called immune surveillance, when your natural killer cells are just floating around and they're constantly checking, all right, all the cells that they come in contact with, all right, they're checking these antigens on all of the nucleated cells, okay? The other type of way, all right, to present an antigen is through the APCs. What are the APCs? Dendritic cells, macrophages, and the B lymphocytes. These cells, all right, will present antigens that they found or came in contact with, all right, to immune cells, okay? So the antigen presenting cell, let's just say it's a, dendrit, a dendritic cell right now, okay? It finds an antigen, it processes it, we'll talk about how it processes it in a second, and then it sticks it on its plasma membrane. So it floats around looking, all right, for a helper T cell or a cytotoxic T cell. And when it comes in contact with one of those, they're going to bind to each other, all right, and they're going to be like in a holding pattern, all right, while that T cell evaluates that antigen to see if it is self or non-self. That's what it's trying to do. Okay, so in order for this to occur, in order for us, all right, to bind these antigens, we need what's called a major histocompatibility complex, or an MHC, okay, an MHC, which is a special type of protein found on the plasma membrane, okay? So there's two types. Our class one, which is found on all the nucleated cells, so every cell in your body that has a nucleus, has a class one, all right, major histocompatibility complex located on its plasma membrane. All right, the other type is the class two, which is only found on APCs, antigen presenting cells. In addition to the class one, because the antigen presenting cells are nucleated. So they too have a nucleus. So they have both type one and type two, all right, or class one and class two, okay? So this complex here is needed, all right, so we can attach the antigen onto the plasma membrane. After I show you this picture, you'll understand what I'm talking about, 
Okay, so in order to get this antigen exposed on the outside of the cell, we need this MC or MHC molecule because it ba basically holds on to that antigen and shows it on the plasma membrane. Okay, so memorize this. MHC1 is on all the nucleated cells. MHC2 is only on the antigen-presenting cells in addition to the class 1. Okay. So go back up here to the top. Two categories of cells present antigens. Every single cell in your body that has a nucleus will present antigens. All right? And those antigens, for the most part, should be self. Okay? The other type of cell that presents antigens are named after it, the APCs. Okay? Which is going to be dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you how okay, these cells present the antigens. Okay, so we're going to start off in a normal cell. This is a healthy cell. This is going on in your body right now when you're feeling fine. You're not sick. There's no virus. There's no bacteria. This is an ongoing process. As you're sitting here, your cells are doing this. They're doing this, okay? So when we talk about the MHC class 1, right, that's going to be pretty much any cell that has a nucleus, okay? So, these cells are going to undergo this process here. So here's what we, we, we see. When we talk about, all right, presenting the antigen, an antigen is either a protein or it's a large polysaccharide, okay? So those proteins and those polysaccharides are unique to you, okay? They're inside your cell. They might have been left over from you making a protein for something else. It doesn't matter, okay? But what your cell will do is, all right, it's going to package it up, all right, and it's going to send it to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So we're going to see the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the RER, all right? What it's going to do, it's going to take this protein, a peptide fragment, something, something that's unique to you, okay? And it's going to insert it into the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to hook it up, all right, with one of our MHC class 1 histocompatibility complex molecules. Let me show you the picture. I'm going to come right back to this. I like tell, telling stories, and this is a good story to tell. All right. So, again, this is a normal, healthy cell. Okay. So, what we're going to see is all right, you have a bunch of these protein fragments, peptide fragments, floating around. Okay. So what your cell does is it takes it, it packages it up, inserts it into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You probably don't remember this from chapter four in bio 210, all right? But any protein that comes out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, all right, and gets sent to the Golgi apparatus is either going to be inserted into the plasma membrane, we didn't really talk about that in 210, or it's going to be exported out of the cell, okay? So if it's going through this process, it's either going to be put into the plasma membrane or it's going to be sent out of the cell. So this is what your cell is doing all the time. It's packaging up some proteins, attaches it onto the MHC1, class 1, histocompatibility complex, sticks it on there. I'll zoom in so you can see. Here's that protein fragment all by itself. All right, and here's that MHC class 1 by itself. Now it sticks it on there. So you have your self-antigen, something that's unique to you, okay? And then our class 1, MHC, and we package it up into a transport vesicle. It gets sent to the Golgi apparatus, which gets modified and all this other stuff happens to it. All right? And then eventually it gets packaged up into what we call a secretory vesicle. And it gets exported all right, to the plasma membrane. And that it fuses into the plasma membrane. Now you can see, all right, this cell, all right, is exposing the self antigen to the external cell environment. Well, guess what? When a natural killer cell comes floating along and it's checking cells, are you normal? Should you be here? Should you be here? All right, it's going to see this cell has the self antigen on it and be like, okay, you should be, you should be here. I don't need to kill you. You're not a tumor cell. You're not a foreign cell, you're fine, and it moves on. 
See how, why our cells need to do that? Because we need to express these self antigens to want to protect ourselves, but our immune surveillance cells come through and they check things. Is it a damaged cell? Well, if it's damaged, we need to destroy it. If it's an infected cell and it doesn't have a self antigen, all right, on the exterior part and it has a foreign antigen, then we'll kill it. Okay, so this is ongoing all of the time. That's what we're seeing here. Okay, so pretty much if we have a self antigen, all right, the immune cells will ignore the self antigens. It moves on. Okay, if it's non self, okay, or foreign, then we're going to initiate the immune system. All right, and we're going to pull in one of our cytotoxic T cells that could come in and kill that cell off. All right, we'll go through that. We'll get into, the, in, into that. But I want you to understand that all your nucleated cells, that's what they're doing as we're sitting here. And they're just sticking on these, I say normal, these self antigens on the plasma membrane surface. So the immune cells that do immune surveillance, all right, be like, okay, you're normal, you're fine. All right, I'll move on to the next one. You kind of see that? If you're not sure, really seriously, I'm not going to go through this because um, I know you guys can read this. Read, thought, do it step by step. Class one, what happens with the, the MHC class one? All right, it's being generated and made here in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right, uh, the self antigen, all right, protein or polysaccharide gets uh, bound onto it, it gets packaged up sent to the Golgi apparatus, it goes through the processes of modification and packaged up again through the Golgi apparatus, and then it gets inserted into the plasma membrane. All right, that way then when the immune surveillance cells come by, they see it as a self antigen, they're like, all right, that cell is safe, it can be here. Now, let's challenge that with an unhealthy cell, okay? This, that was a healthy cell, all right? With an unhealthy cell, say, let's say somehow a virus managed to make its way into our cell. It got in. Damn it. All right. Now we've got to fix this problem. Okay. So what happens is, all right, the cell will package up, all right, using proteosomes, which are the organelles, if you remember from chapter four, the organelles that go around and kind of gobble up, all right, proteins. Okay, so these proteosomes, all right, digest, all right, parts of this virus, all right, and what will happen is now we're going to take those parts of that virus and insert it, all right, into our rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, that's where we're making our MHC class one, all right, histocompatibility transmembrane proteins. Okay, and so what do we do? We take that viral protein or whatever and we stick it on the MHC class one. Okay, it gets sent out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, goes into the Golgi apparatus, go, undergoes modification, yada, yada, and then it gets packaged up, okay, into our secretory vesicle, all right, and it gets exported to the plasma membrane. And then these MHC class one transmembrane proteins get stuck, in, I shouldn't say stuck, but get placed into the plasma membrane. But now in this situation, they're showing all right, a foreign antigen, a non-cell. So what do you think is gonna happen when an immune cell comes by and sees that? What's gonna happen? Yeah, we're gonna initiate, we're gonna start the immune process, all right? We will, we, will, we will signal, it's like the fire alarm goes off, all right? This shouldn't be here. Now, all right, we get our cytotoxic uh, T cell to come in and take care of business, which we'll get to that, all right? But do you kind of see now, all right, this cell, all right, if we go from this slide here, all right, this is a nice healthy cell, okay? Well, now a virus has penetrated your body, all right? It's found its way into this cell, and now that health, once healthy cell is now an unhealthy cell because the virus got in there, okay? And your cell then, all right, broke down parts of the virus, okay? And then it packaged up those foreign antigens, 
all right, and packaged it up nicely with the MHC class one because it's a nucleated cell and they have class one, all right, and it packaged all that up and now it's expressing these foreign antigens on the external surface of the cell. And so your immune system can now recognize like, whoa, this is bad, this is not good, all right? It recognizes those foreign antigens as non-self, bam, we can initiate the immune reaction, all right? Which we'll talk about. Okay, so you heard me talk about MHC class one. What about the other one, the MHC class two? Bam, all right, MHC class two have to do with antigen presenting cells. Okay, we only see these on the antigen presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, B lymphocytes, all right? These are, again, glycoproteins that are going to sit, all right, on the plasma membrane, okay? So very similar type of scenario. These types of, 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 of receptors, okay, all right, the class two, are going to be made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, sent to the Golgi apparatus and modified, and then eventually inserted into the plasma membrane. All right, but their job is to take in these guys, exogenous antigens. What is that? An antigen that was found on the outside that the cell took, brought in, okay? APCs, antigen presenting cells, are phagocytic cells. That's the Pac-Man cell. It goes around and it gobbles stuff up. And so that's what this exogenous antigen was. It was a protein or a, a huge sugar that was outside the cell. The cell came across and said, I'm going to inspect this. And the only way that it can do that is it has to eat it. And then it breaks it down inside. Okay? So it gobbles it up. Okay, and then it breaks it down and it puts it into the phagosome. And then what we're going to do is we're going to merge that with a lysosome. What's a lysosome? It's basically an organelle that is loaded with digestive enzymes. All right, you heard me talk about the respiratory burst. All right, these chemicals here that just break things down. Okay, so once that occurs, we have what's known as a phagolysosome. All right. And eventually what's going to happen is this phagolysosome is going to meet up, all right, with a vesicle that has our class 2 molecule inside. And then all of those are going to merge together, all right, and that, MH, uh, that MHC class 2, all right, glycoprotein is then going to attach itself onto that antigen that the cell brought in from the outside. And what's it going to do? It's going to stick it in its own plasma membrane. All right? And then what we're going to have happen now is our antigen presenting cell is going to seek out, all right, one of our T cells, the helper T cells, the CD4 cells, and see one, if this is a foreign antigen, all right, and two, should we initiate the immune response? All right, let me go into a little bit more detail here. I love pictures, so I'll show you. All right, so here's our antigen presenting cell, all right, our dendritic cell or macrophage, whatever. Okay, so we, here's our foreign antigen, all right. For this example, we'll say it's a bacteria. So being a, a, a phagocytic antigen presenting cell, what's it do? It gobbles up. That pro, not the pro, not the bacteria there, okay, puts it into a phagosome, okay, and it will then bind with a lysosome, and that lysosome dumps its digestive contents into the phagosome, and it breaks down that bacteria there, okay. Meanwhile, all right, while all this is going on, your rough endoplasmic reticulum is making its MHC class two, all right, histocompatibility complex, okay? It's made that, it sends it through the Golgi apparatus, like it's always done in the previous examples, and then it puts it into a secretory vesicle, and that secretory vesicle will then merge with the phagolysosome, and the MHC class two molecule 
will then attach itself to the foreign antigens. And the cell, the APC, will then display, all right, the foreign antigens on the MHC class two molecules to the external environment here. And it's going to look for a helper T cell. Okay? But don't forget the um, uh, antigen presenting cells also have MHC class one because they're a nucleated cell. Okay? So they have both, which is good. More than one. More is better, right? More money, more problems. That's a song. I don't know the song, though. All right. So here's an example. Let's take a look here and see what I'm kind of talking about. All right. Here's our antigen presenting cell, the dendritic cell. And if you notice, all right, take a close look here, you notice it's got class one and class two, all right, with antigens. Some of those might be self antigens, but probably not, all right? Several of those will be foreign antigens for this example, okay? Now, it's going to come in contact with, all right, a, a T lymphocyte, a T cell. It's either going to be a CD4 or a CD8. Now, this is where it comes in to play. It's very important that you understand this, all right? I call it the rule of eight. Okay, the rule of eight. Eight is the magic number in this scenario. Here's what I mean. All right, the CD8, uh, 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 the cytotoxic T cell, which is the, the CD8 cell, all right, it can only bind to the MHC class one receptor. One times eight is eight. That's how I remembered it. Okay, so the, C, with the cytotoxic T cell. All right, or the CD8 cell can only bind to the MHC class one receptor. The CD4, the helper T cell, can only bind to the MHC class two receptor. All right, so two times four is eight. Okay, CD4, class two, all right, multiply those two numbers is eight. That's how I remembered it, okay, however it works for you. Okay, so that's how you know. So MHC class twos, which are found on antigen presenting cells, they can only dock their class two receptor with a CD4 cell, helper T cell, okay? Whereas class ones, all right, can only go with the cytotoxic T cell. So all nucleated cells can go with the cytotoxic T cell, all right? And APC cells have both, so they can dock with either or because they have both MHC classes. They have class one and they have class two. So antigen presenting cells can dock with both. But, but all nucleated cells, okay, only display MHC class one. So that means they can only dock with a CD8 cell a cytotoxic T cell, okay? Keep that in mind, all right? Antigen presenting cells, they're good. They can go to both, all right? So this is why when we talk about uh, uh, transplants, liver, heart, all right, tissue transplants in general, you ever wonder why people had to undergo immunosuppressants, all right? This is why, okay? Because you think about it, I am giving you, my kidney, it's got the genetic makeup that's unique to me. My body will recognize that as self, but guess what? Your body won't, all right? So those, uh, uh, the major histocompatibility complex, the class ones, all right, of my tissue that I gave to you, all right, those cells will keep doing that same process inside of you, but now, all right, the self, uh, uh, um, antigens that would have been for me are considered foreign by you. So your immune system would start to attack, all right, the transplanted tissue. That's why we have to give you immunosuppressant drugs because your immune system, the adaptive immune system, and even parts of the innate immune system would simply destroy that transplanted um, tissue mainly because of this. 
the MHC molecules. That whole process that I just explained to you, okay? Because that transplanted tissue will be recognized as a foreign antigen because it's not self, all right? So that's why your body would attack it. Okay, this is a lot. Are your brains full? Are they hurting yet? Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Who would have thought that the immune system was as complex as it is? It's fascinating stuff. There's a lot involved. But um, let's talk about the life of a lymphocyte, okay? What its life cycle is. All right, this is a little bit more. Now we can kind of turn down our brains a little bit. Um, we'll just go straight memorization here, okay? But there's three parts to the life of a lymphocyte. Okay, the first one obviously is how do we make them? How do we form the lymphocytes? All right, that's going to be uh, involve all right the primary lymphoid tissue. What's that? The red bone marrow. Okay, remember all your lymphocytes are made in your bone marrow in the red bone marrow. Okay, and if you're a T lymphocyte, you have to go to the thymus. If you're a B lymphocyte, you go somewhere else. You can hang out in the blood, but normally if you're a B lymphocyte, you're going to head over to some secondary lymphatic tissue. Maybe a lymph node for a while. Hang out in the spleen. I don't care, but you're not going to, you're not going to the thymus. Only the T cells go to the thymus, okay? So when these lymphocytes are made, okay, they are, here's the crazy part. Remember, we're dealing with adaptive all right, immunity, and adaptive immunity means a specific lymphocyte is specifically designed to recognize a specific antigen okay so that's what's going to happen here all right once these lymphocytes are made they're going to come in contact with one specific antigen and that's what they're going to deal with okay so now we've made the lymphocytes but they're young okay it's not like you know when when you make a kid you don't just kick it out of the house it's got to grow up it's got to mature all right that's what we're going to do here so we're going to send some of these lymphocytes to our secondary lymphatic structures here, right? Where eventually they'll be exposed to an antigen, okay? And then activated. And if when they're activated, the first thing we do is to get help. How do we do that? We make more lymphocytes specific for that antigen. Okay? If you want to kill off, all right, a virus what you need is help and you want to make more cells exactly like the one that's killing and fighting off the virus so that's what we do here we are going to replicate all right the same type of lymphocyte to destroy whatever that antigen is okay and then we have finally the effector response all right and we have to eliminate that antigen okay now with the t lymphocytes we're going to see them they move into the site of infection Okay, where the B lymphocytes, they're too lazy. They're going to stay in their secondary lymphatic structures. And that's okay, because some of them, all right, a good number of them are going to convert into plasma cells. Okay, and when that happens, the plasma cells are going to be making the antibodies. And the antibodies go into circulation. And they'll travel around the blood, and then they'll eventually make their way to the site of infection. Okay. So the B lymphocytes have it pretty good, okay? They're gonna stay, and that's why a lot of the antigen presenting cells, all right, are gonna be found in the circulation traveling through your lymphatic system. All right, remember, what we talked about, the macrophages are going to be some of the first cells on site of an, of an infection or an injury. So they migrate into the tissue, they start chewing up and finding infectious agents, they get flushed into the lymphatic system, and then they start being washed throughout your lymphatic vessels going from lymph node to lymph node. Well, what's waiting in the lymph nodes, all right? Be lymphocytes, all right? You'll have some T cells in there too, all right? But the macrophage acts as an antigen presenting cell and it can present the foreign antigen to the B uh, lymphocyte. And then that lymphocyte can then transform or transition into a plasma cell and then make antibodies. We like antibodies. Antibodies are good, okay? So we're gonna talk about some of this stuff here, but I wanna get into and talk about 
how we make our lymphocytes here. Okay, so basically what I was saying before, okay, you have your red bone marrow that's making all the lymphocytes, and they're going to dump, all right, the lymphocytes into circulation. All right, but what will happen is, all right, the T lymphocytes, all right, are going to head to the thymus, and that's when they have to uh, undergo initiation. They're going to join a club, and this club is a life and death club. It's like fight club. Okay, so they're going to go into this club, and if they don't pass the tests, they die. And in fact, 98% of the cells that go into this club die. I don't want to join a club like that, do you? Heck no, all right? 2% live, okay? The other lymphocytes, our B lymphocytes, will head off to some of the secondary lymphatic tissues there. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of this. All right, so here you can see, all right, when we undergo, all right, the activation of our lymphocytes, well, one, where are they? Lip nodes, these are secondary lymphatic structures, spleen, tonsils, all right, we're going to undergo some sort of, of response, okay, and it can involve actual chemicals from the cells themselves to cause apoptosis, all right, we can recruit the complement or we can recruit antibodies and those antibodies can destroy those pathogens all right and cause apoptosis we're going to talk about all this stuff in a little bit more detail here all right but first let's just talk about some easy stuff and talk about how all right we make our t lymphocytes a mature t lymphocyte we're going to talk about how they get selected to uh, become what we call a naive t lymphocyte okay so we've said this many many times T lymphocytes are made in the red bone marrow. They are going to then head over towards the thymus, all right, and undergo their maturation process here. So at this point, before they, when they get to the thymus, they haven't decided whether they're going to be a T lymph, excuse me, a, a, a T cell, a, a helper T cell, or a cytotoxic T cell. They haven't gotten, all right, their uh, CD4 or CD8 only proteins. They have both. All right, amongst other proteins, uh, uh, they have CD25, CD20. All right, they have a whole bunch of these cluster differentiation proteins. All right, but at this point, they haven't determined whether they're a T helper cell or a cytotoxic T cell. Okay, and this is a random process. Okay, it just happens. All right, so prior to that, it's got to get tested. We're not even going to let that cell determine if it's going to be a T helper cell or a cytotoxic T cell because we got to test you first, and then if you survive the tests, then you can undergo the differentiation process to determine whether or not you're a helper T cell or a cytotoxic T cell, okay? So first things first, all right, we're going to go through this testing process to see if this cell can even bind to an MHC complex, okay? we got to see if it can even bind to one of those things. Class one, class two, doesn't matter. We want to see if it can bind, all right? So we want to find out, all right, if it binds to non-self, what happens, or if it binds to a foreign antigen, okay? So let me jump into this part here, all right? This is called the thymic selection process. Check that out. Look at that stat. 98% of T cells that your red bone marrow makes gets eliminated right off the bat. And that's pretty stringent, okay? So these two terms here, positive selection and negative selection, all right, what we're going to see is, all right, how well the, these T cells can bind on to just regular epithelial cells. Remember, class one is on all nucleated cells, okay? So we're going to test to see if they can even bind. So if they bind on, all right, to one of those epithelial cells, then cool. You pass the first test. We now know that you can bind onto an MHC, all right, uh, protein. All right, fine. Okay. So if they cannot bind to those epithelial cells, all right, then we clear them and we get rid of them. Okay. Okay, so 
So first part is positive selection. Okay, we bind it, we see if they can bind to any type of cell. If it can't, it's done. Okay? Negative selection. Now we need to test to see if it can recognize and bind to a foreign antigen. Okay, a non-self. All right. So we get our APCs. Remember, dendritic cells, what type of, of class do they have on them? They have MHC class 1, but also MHC class 2. And we're going to be utilizing the class 2. Okay? So the dendritic cells all right, are going to now present all right, a self-antigen. And here's the thing. If these cells bind onto the self-antigen, all right, we can't have that. So what we do is we destroy those cells. Okay? So the first test is whether they can bind onto anything. Okay? And the second test is, all right, we need to determine if they can bind if they can to differentiate between self versus non-self. If they bind onto a self antigen, well, we can't have that. So we got to get rid of them. If they don't bind on to a self antigen, then it's assumed that they can bind on to a foreign antigen and they're allowed to live. Okay? After it goes through the selection process, it's then that we see that the T lymphocytes that are allowed to live can then differentiate into either the helper T cell or the cytotoxic T cell. Okay? Which means if you're a helper T cell, you have the CD4 protein. Okay, which means you get rid of the CD8. If you're a cytotoxic T cell, okay, you're going to keep the CD8 and you're going to get rid of the CD4. CD4 bind on to MHC class one or two. Rule of eight. Two, right. Okay. And cytotoxic T lymphocytes, okay, the CD8s bind on to MHC class. Nice. You didn't even wait for me to finish. I love it. Good, good, good. Yep, class one. Okay, remember, rule of eight. Okay, one times eight is eight. Four times two is eight. Okay, that's how I remembered it. So here's the picture. Shows you what's going on. Positive selection. Nice flow chart and everything. Okay, here's our class one cell. Epithelial cell, minus own business, it's displaying the self-antigen, okay? And then we bring the thymocyte because it hasn't determined whether it's going to be a CD4 or CD8. So it comes in, all right? We see if it binds or not. If it binds, it lives. If it does not bind, all right, then it's, it's killed, okay? That's positive selection. Negative all right, the second part is now we bring in our APC cell, okay? And same scenario here, we're going to test to see if it binds. All right, in this case, all right, if it binds, it's destroyed, okay? Because remember, these cells are going to be displaying self antigens, okay? So the APC cell is only going to be displaying self-antigens. If it's binding to a self-antigen, it's going to end up initiating autoimmune uh, disease or some sort of autoimmune condition. We can't have that. So we got to get rid of those cells. All right? If it doesn't recognize and bind to the cell, then it lives. And then at that point, then it's allowed to undergo all right, the next step in which it transforms into either a T helper all right, with the CD4 protein or the cytotoxic T lymphocyte, which has the CD8. And we refer to these types of lymphocytes as naive. Okay, they haven't come in contact yet with their specific antigen. Okay, they haven't undergone an, an immune type of response at all. So they're naive. Okay, so after it undergoes all this, now these cells are ready to go. They can now leave the thymus, and they can get dumped back into all right, circulation through the blood and through the lymphatic system. All right, 
then eventually they're going to go to the secondary lymphatic structures, lymph nodes, spleen, wherever, all right? And they're just going to hang out there, okay, until they get exposed to a specific antigen that they were designed to uh, uh, react with. Up in that point, if they haven't had an interaction with an antigen, then we consider them to be naive uh, T lymphocytes, okay? So once they leave the, the thymus uh, gland, all right, then they get their uh, certificate of completion, all right, and they're considered to be immunocompetent. Congratulations, you can now interact with the immune system and initiate the immune uh, 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 reaction of whatever, depending on what type of antigen you come in contact with. You heard me talk about the Tregs, the regulatory uh, T lymphocytes. All right. So in some situations, our CD4, the helper, he, helper T cells, will bind with the self antigens. And in some of these cases, it can in, inhibit the immune response. In some cases, that's good. All right. But in some cases, that's bad. If you've got cells that are inhibiting your immune response, a perfect example is in cancer. Okay. That's the time that you don't want to initiate the immune response. I mean, uh, you don't want to inhibit the immune response, all right? When tumor cells are starting to grow, we all know that neoplastic cells start to reproduce at an increased rate. It's a bad thing for them to, to, to continue to uh, proliferate and divide and eat up our resources in our body. Well, what will happen is some of these tumor cells, all right, can stimulate these CD4 cells to transition into what we call Tregs, regulatory T lymphocytes. And when that happens, all right, you're suppressing the immune system. Well, that is one of the ways that your body is able to fight off cancer on its own. All right, the actual initiating the immune response. Because remember, some tumor cells, all right, when they take over, they um, exhibit odd glycoproteins on their plasma membrane, okay? Those glycoproteins right, will be recognized as non-self. And then if you get one of our T cells or the natural killer cell just floating around doing its immune surveillance, it recognizes that and it goes after it. Well, if we are stimulating the proliferation of the Tregs, they'll downgrade the response. They'll suppress the immune system. And in some cases, that's bad news because then it allows cancer to slip under the radar. That's a problem, okay? And so we want to maintain our immune response. So the nice thing is when we get a T lymphocyte that actually has come in contact with an antigen, it's like, yes, it's found an antigen. Now let's kill this thing. Let's find, there's more, there's gotta be more out there. So the first thing that it's gonna do is it's gonna start making clones of itself, all right? Specific for that antigen that it found. And the nice thing is that these clones are going to have the exact same, if it's a T cell, the exact same T cell receptor, which is specific for that antigen. So we don't have to guess and find a new one. Or if it's a B cell, it had the same type of B cell receptor. So it's great. These cells are pre-made with all right, the ability to recognize that specific antigen, which is huge because it takes a while to make these cells. So if you come in contact with this antigen again years later, well, you have, all right, um, some cells that already have these receptors that are, and we'll talk about that with the memory uh, T cells there, okay? So the first, this whole process when, when the T lymphocyte, all right, or any lymphocyte comes in contact with an antigen for the first time, we call that the antigen challenge. All right, the antigen challenge. Most commonly, this will uh, occur, all right, in the lymphatic, the secondary lymphatic tissues, because that's where a lot of the antigen, well, that's where most, all right, of your uh, lymphocytes are hanging out. They're going to be in the secondary, it's not in circulation, it's not going to be in the lymphatic circulation, it's certainly not going to be in the, your, your uh, blood uh, circulation, it's going to be in the tissues, all right? your lymph nodes, the spleen, all right, these secondary lymph your tonsils, these secondary lymphatic structures. And I keep 
neglecting to talk about the malts, the, the mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. Remember we talked about those globs of just random lymphatic tissue throughout certain organs and whatnot. Um, so those places too are where a lot of these lymphocytes hang out, okay? So what will happen is, all right, we'll take that antigen, all right, to one of these secondary lymphatic structures, could be the spleen, could be the lymph node, all right, and it will actually then present those, those antigens to, all right, the lymphocytes there to initiate the immune response. And I keep talking about the immune response. We haven't even gotten to that yet, all right? We haven't even talked about what's going to happen in a second. All this is kind of building up to that which I think is going to be, ah, perfect. This is a good place to break. I know, I know you guys want me to keep going. All right, fine, I'll keep going. I'm kidding. Let's take a break, all right? If your brains are full, this is quite a bit um, of what we were going through, but this is a perfect uh, place to break. All right, folks, I'll see you at home in lab. If you have questions, ask me in lab.